What's going on here? Oh, it's way down there. Sorry about that. Get up there. This function here, Janessa, is a way for us to calculate the amount of money that the company needs to have in their bank account based on the number of employees. And it says N is the number of employees. So if I put in 100 for N here, for N, I would get 1,500 times 100 plus 2,500, and I would get the amount of money that needs to be in the account according to their rules. On the other hand, for whatever reason, the number of employees in the company changes throughout the month. And we have a second formula here which says that the number of employees depends on the day of the month. Now, there could be a number of reasons for that, and I don't want to get into the economics of why that might happen. But the bottom line is, on the first day of the month, they don't have very many people. And on the second day, they have more people, and then they have more and more and more and more until the end of the month, and then the end of the month comes, and they lose people. Uh, very quickly, it could be that at the end of the month, everybody is paid, and it happens to be in a community where there are a lot of people leaving the community. There's a lot of uh, movement in and out of the community, and at the end of the month when people get paid, that's when people leave. Could be all kinds of reasons. But the bottom line here, I want to illustrate these two functions in a different way, is if you take the number of days, you can calculate the number of employees using the formula that I've highlighted in green. And if you take the number of employees, you can calculate the amount of money using the formula that I've highlighted in blue. So if I said to you that it was day six, and I said, how much money do they need, you would have to calculate the number of employees first using the green formula, and then calculate the amount of money using the blue formula. Okay. What this question is asking you to do, though, is to find an equation relating the amount of money to the day, bypassing that initial calculation. So what we're going to do is we're going to put the function for n in to the function m. It's just a substitution. And this is a case, I will admit, where it makes it a little bit more confusing because of the function notation. So if you like. Forget about all this function notation. I was going to say function notation nonsense. It's not nonsense. It means something. But it can seem confusing. What is the formula for the amount of money in relation to the day of the month? Well, it's clearly not C or D. Because C and D both have number of employees equals. We want money equals. So all I'm going to do is take this. Whoops. All I'm going to do here, Janessa, is take this and load it in right here and see what happens. So what's going to happen? Let's see. I'm going to have the amount of money in the account is 1,500 times the number of employees plus 2,500. But the number of employees is 12 times the day number plus 15. And now I just simplify it. So 1,500 times 12D. I don't know. I think it's 18,000 D. Well, it has to be 18,000 D because that's what's in the choices, right? 18,000 D. And then I'm going to have 1,500 times 15, which is, I think, 22,500. So plus 22,500 plus the 2,500, 22,500 plus 2,500 is 25,000, so that's why the answer is B. Is that okay? All right, other questions? Yeah. Uh, number 19. 19? So this is related to this graph. We've got f of x and g of x. And you know, I know I've mentioned this before, but always look above these context boxes to find out 
how many questions it is we're going to be using this for. It's for the next three questions. So what is question 19? Question 19 is what is the non-permissible value for the function f of x over g of x? And you'll notice, everybody, that when I read that, I said f of x over g of x. My brain automatically translates f over g to f of x over g of x. So why do we have a non-permissible value? Why is it we have a non-permissible value when we divide functions? The reason we get a non-permissible value when you divide functions is that is not allowed. You are not allowed to divide by 0. So f of x over g of x is, we're allowed to do this as long as f of x and g of x both exist. And I want to pause there and point out to you that since both of these functions on the graph extend from negative infinity to infinity horizontally, they exist over the domain of all real numbers, you can divide them anywhere except when you're dividing by 0. So when is g of x 0? I want to write this out just so we can see this statement. When is g of x equal to 0? Because that's not allowed, because we're dividing by g of x. Well, g of x is equal to 0. g of x is equal to negative 1 here. It's equal to positive 1 here. It's equal to positive 2 here. It's equal to 0 there. Don't forget, this goes back to probably grade 10 math, when you're given this function notation for the first time. Does anybody remember what your teacher told you f of x is? See, we've been steeped in all kinds of interpretations of it, but your teacher probably told you it's y. f of x is y. So g of x is y h of x is y. And all I'm getting at here, Ashley, is that y is equal to 0 here on g of x, which means that's a point that's not allowed. But y is equal to 0, but when we talk about non-permissible values, we're interested in what x is at that point. And the value of x at that point is 4, which means x is not allowed to be 4, because if it is, then the y-coordinate of g is 0, which means you'll be dividing by 0. And we almost come full circle here because I want to remind you that function operations, everybody, are all about y-coordinates, right? You add the y-coordinates, you subtract, you multiply, you divide the y-coordinates. So when the y-coordinate on g is 0, you get slapped on the hand by the math gods because that's not allowed. So if x is not allowed to be 4, the answer to the question is the non-permissible value for x is 4. Is that okay? Yeah. All right. Uh, Lynette, you had a question? Um, 11. 11? Yeah. One part of this unit, and it's a very thin layer to this unit, is solving rational equations, I want to do that again, is solving rational equations graphically. Last year in 20-1, you were taught how to solve rational equations algebraically, and in this course, the objective is you can solve them graphically. What does that have to do with this question? Well, you're given a formula for the height of a rocket as a function of the initial speed. And again, if that function notation is bothering you, then ignore the function notation. It's not important here. It's just saying height depends on v. So we write h as a function of v. The maximum height is 5,000 kilometers. What's the initial speed? So what you're ultimately asked to do here, Lynette, is solve this equation. Now, you're given this domain, and 
I don't think we really need to worry about why the domain is what it is, but I will tell you that if the velocity is more than the square root of 125, you'll get a negative height. This thing becomes negative, so it's no longer valid. If we go with what we're supposed to learn in this course about these rational equations, which is to solve them graphically, then my advice to you would be to use the y1, y2 approach. You understand what I mean because I see you nodding. I'm not, uh, we could zero the equation, we could subtract 5,000 from both sides and find x-intercepts of the resulting function, but I prefer not to. I, I prefer the y1, y2 method, so y1 is 5,000, y2 is 6378x squared divided by, I'm going to have to put that denominator in brackets on my calculator, 125 minus x squared, and you know, I don't, I don't know how this is taught in other courses, but you shouldn't be just kind of throwing darts in the dark here and picking a window setting and hoping it works. You should take a methodical approach. V is the speed, and it can be anything from 0 to the square root of 125. The square root of 121 is 11. We're talking about 0 to 11, approximately. So I'm going to set up my table to start at zero and go up by one automatically. So I can just track what the y coordinate is up to around 10 or 11 or 12. And this is going to be helpful because then I can use this information to set up my window settings, right? Um, the height is, well, it's going up to about 6,000, right? at the eight second mark and then it's coming back, no, it's continuing to rise after 10 seconds. And then of course, later on it becomes negative and that's not valid. All this is telling me, Lynette, is that if I go to my window settings, zero to 12 will probably cover it. Well, not probably, it will, because it's already back down to negative. And it was over 5,000, I'm gonna go 6,500. I suppose in retrospect, we didn't need to do that. If we want to see where it reaches 5,000, then we need to look up at 5,000, right? Anyway, when I graph it, there's the 5,000. Here comes my formula for the height as a function of the velocity. I can find the intersection point. So it's reaching a velocity of 5,000. Uh, sorry, it's reaching a height of 5,000 meters if the initial velocity is about 7.4 kilometers per second. I realize now I was misspeaking and I was attributing x to time a second ago, I believe. It's velocity that is x. Is that okay, Lynette? You could, of course, solve this algebraically. Going back to math 20-1, I can multiply both sides by this. I didn't teach all of you math 20-1, but those of you that I did, I would have told you, it's not that we're cross-multiplying, we're multiplying both sides by the denominator to clean things up. And what you end up with, I'm going to multiply this through now, uh, but I'm going to ask somebody to help me out here, what's 125 times 5,000? Is it 625,000? Okay, thank you. So I get 625,000 minus the 5,000 times the V squared equals, well, this cancels, 6378 V squared. This equation to solve algebraically is not a big deal because even though it's quadratic, there's no V terms. There's no linear terms. There's only quadratic terms and constant terms. So if I add 5,000 V squared to both sides, I get 11,378 V squared equals 62,000. Am I missing a zero here? Yeah, I am, eh? 625,000. So to find V, you can take 625,000 divided by 11,000 
378 and take the square root, and that will do it as well. And you know, I, I, I think we talked a little bit about this one last week. I don't want to say one method is better than the other. If you're quick on your calculator, solving it graphically is a snap. If your calculator is problematic for you in terms of window settings and that kind of thing, then this is pretty simple. Other questions? Go ahead. 35. 35. So we're given some functions, f of theta equals 1 minus sine squared of theta, g of theta equals tan squared theta, h of theta is 1 over 1 plus tan squared theta. And then, and this is a complicated question. The way it's worded is complicated. And then it asks us, forget about the first part of this question. Then it asks us, what is r plus h of theta? What is r plus h of theta? So this is the answer to the question, OK? Well, that means r of theta plus h of theta. OK. Well, h of theta, we know what h of theta is. That's easy. That's 1 over 1 plus tan squared of theta. We don't know what r of theta is, though. What r of theta is, what r of theta is, is f of theta times g of theta. So we're, we're kind of like somebody's left the breadcrumbs here, and we've got to follow the breadcrumbs to get to the reward. The bottom line here is we need to figure out what r of theta is first. Now, there's an option here, Janessa, and I'm going to ask you your opinion. We can figure out what r of theta is on the side and then throw it in right here. Or I can just write f of theta times g of theta right here. Which would you like to do? The first one. So we're going to find out what r of theta is off on the side. r of theta is equal to f of theta, which is 1 minus sine squared of theta. I'm going to need a little more room. Kind of lousy planning there. Multiplied by g of theta. So you see why I'm taking f times g to get r. Okay. And g of theta is tan squared of theta. Now. The other aspect or layer to this question, everybody, is that it tells you that this thing, our answer, is going to be a number. It's not going to have theta in it. It's going to be a number because it's a numerical response. We're asked to enter the value of it, so it's a number. That means that this stuff is going to be simplified or needs to be simplified. And this question, ultimately, everybody, has now all of a sudden turned into a trigonometric identities equation or question. You should know that 1 minus sine squared of theta is cosine squared of theta. That should be almost, I would dare say, recognizable. That you see 1 minus sine squared, and you go, oh, that's cosine squared. You should also know that tan squared of theta is sine squared of theta over cos squared of theta. And I would even go so far as to say, you should know that's going to be the path you take because the cos squareds will cancel. And you know what I'm really saying, everybody, is I'm telling you that this is something that I think most people will just say, oh, that's sine squared. Because tan squared is sine squared over cos squared, and the cos squareds cancel. Anyway, r of theta is sine squared of theta. Now, where do you go from here? Well, look, you could. You could put this over 1 and use a common denominator. But and we have to be aware that you do need to know all of this trig for your diploma exam. But one of the things I told you is that when you see the number 1 and squares of trig ratios, there's probably a Pythagorean identity that you can use. 
And I believe 1 plus tan squared of theta, but you're going to check it out for me, 1 plus tan squared of theta is secant squared of theta. So that means that I can write, instead of working with a common denominator, I can write sine squared of theta plus 1 over secant squared of theta. But now you should say, well, I know what secant squared of theta is. Secant squared of theta is the reciprocal of cos squared. So that means that 1 over secant squared is cos squared. So what started off as a function operations question, adding functions and multiplying functions, turned into a trigonometric identities question. And we should know, of course, that sine squared of theta plus cos squared of theta is equal to 1. Good? OK. Kai, I saw your hand up. Question 7. 7? You know, whenever I say, oh, a very important question, I know that you probably internally roll your eyes or maybe actually roll your eyes and go, well, he says that about every question. But I'm saying that this is a very important question because it's one of the ones that, you know, if I ask you the, a variation of this question on an exam, many people get this wrong even though you understand the math, but you're just missing something. You're, you're, you're stumbling. It's like forgetting to factor that number out of B to see what H truly is in transformations. It's one of those things that we need to be very cognizant of. What is the Y coordinate of the point of discontinuity? Now, I'm going to do this, and then I'm going to rephrase the question into a, maybe an even more disguised version. So what is a point of discontinuity? A point of discontinuity is a whole... in the function. And a hole in the function exists for a rational function because there's a non-permissible value at that x coordinate and the factor that produces the non-permissible value, which will be in the denominator, has an identical factor in the numerator which cancels. That's the rule that we've learned and sometimes math must be rule oriented. So I'm going to factor, well it doesn't have to be rule oriented, but sometimes rules are useful. Okay? We don't have to understand why they work all the time. I can take a 2 out of the denominator and be left with x minus 5. Presumably, if I'm asking you about a whole, one of the factors in the numerator is x minus 5. But you should be able to factor this numerator anyway, right? Okay. So this cancels, and I'm left with that. Now, if I were to ask you what is the function, and I'm using y, not f of x, you would say x minus 3 over 2, and this would be wrong. This is not the function. However, this is the function, okay? Because unless I say x is not equal to 5 and we graph it, it's not going to have a hole. So that's where we're at. And that means we have a hole at the point 5 comma something. And what you're asked in this question is, what is the y-coordinate of the whole? And, and I know this gets weird to listen to or to hear, but 5 is an x-coordinate that doesn't exist. The y-coordinate of the whole is a number that doesn't exist for the y-coordinate. And we're not allowed to have x equals 5, but to find the y-coordinate that we're not allowed to have, we're going to put the x-coordinate that we're not allowed to have into whatever we have left after we've canceled. So now I'm going to have 5 minus 3, which is 2, over 2, which gives you 1. Okay. Now, there are other variations of this question. For example, I could say, I'll give you a different example, we have the function f of x equals x squared minus 25 over 2x minus 10. And I ask you, what is the range of the function? 
And this is an interesting question because, and I want to show this to you. If we, if, if you just say, well, geez, the question's saying, what's the range? And I go ahead and I throw this into my calculator. What do I have? In the numerator, I have x squared minus 25. Divided by in the denominator, I have 2x minus 10. Well, you're going to get, i got to go zoom standard, sorry. You're going to get a straight line. And you, you can bet your bottom dollar that if this is a multiple choice question, one of the choices I'll have for you is x is any real number. And you'll look at it and you go, oh. <laughs> and you'll giggle to yourself that your math teacher was so stupid as to give you a question you could do on your calculator. But you would be wrong. It's not any real number. And I might have said x. Uh, what I meant was y, because you're asked about the range. So this is the question. What's the range of this? Well, so I, I might have here negative infinity to infinity. I might not even put a y in there, because I want to make sure you understand the difference between domain and range. Okay? And that's not right. So what do you do? Well, you factor this x plus 5, x minus 5, 2, x minus 5, and you cancel. And you better believe that I would have in here, um, I have to disguise this, though. I would have in here for a second choice, negative infinity to negative 5, no, to positive 5 in union with 5 to infinity, which is a f weird way of saying it can't be 5. And that's not right either, because I'm asking you about the range, not the domain. How do we find the range? You put 5 in for x in whatever is left to find the y-coordinate of the whole, so you get 5 plus 5, which is 10 over 2, which happens, oh. <laughs> um, that wasn't very well thought out. It's because of that 2. I'm going to pretend that 2 isn't there. I'm going to go 3. I was wondering why you were smiling, Will. OK, so it's not that you can't have 5. That's for x. You put 5 that's not allowed back into the original function after you cancel. And you have 5 plus 5, which is 10 over 3. And that means that the y-coordinate of the whole is 10 over 3. So That would be the range. I don't know what I would put for a fourth choice, OK? Um, I think if I did this question, though, it probably wouldn't come out to a fraction. It would come out to a whole number. It just wouldn't be the same as the, uh, the whole wouldn't be at 5, 5. It would be at 5, 8 or something. And there's another variation of this question. And I'm sure there's, well, I'm going to find one on this handout. Come on. Uh, there's a better one. Right there, 15. So uh, I've made this even more difficult. I'm disguising the fact that this question 15 is all about a hole. I don't mention a hole anywhere. I ask you about the range. So I'm asking you about y and what y is not allowed to be. I'm not asking you about what x is not allowed to be. And to boot, as my grandfather would say, which means in addition, you don't know the function. There's a parameter there, b, which is unknown. But you still have to be able to factor this 
I can factor a 2 out of the numerator and have left x squared minus 3bx plus 2 over the denominator is x plus b, x minus b. We don't often run into this, but it is in Math 30 that we're seeing this question. I hope if you look up here, everybody, and I need a b squared. If you look up here, everybody, there should be no question at all about how to factor this. Right? It's x minus 2, x minus 1. The fact that it's b squareds for my final term and bx's for my middle term tells me it factors into x minus 2b and x minus 1b. And I'm going through this. I'm sure somebody would have asked, but just in case nobody did ask, I want to go through this question. So is this function defined everywhere? Well, no. It's not defined at negative b for x, and it's not defined at positive b for x. But, and this is going to be helpful for another question that you're going to definitely see something similar to on the exam. Even though x is not allowed to be negative b, that doesn't affect the range of the function because this will be an asymptote. And that means wherever negative b is, if this is x equals negative b, the function will go up and down forever without any breaks at that point without any breaks vertically at that point. There will be a break horizontally. But that doesn't change the range of the function. What's going to change the range of the function away from any real number is this hole. We're going to have a hole at positive b because of the canceling. So what will the range be? The range is going to be determined by the y-coordinate of the hole. So I have to put b... I have to put in here and here. Nope. I have to put in here and here, put in for x, the x-coordinate of the hole, which is b. And I'm going to get, what's that thing? Hmm. I'm going to get, let's see, 2 times b minus 2b over b plus b. Well, what is that? That's 2 times negative b over 2b. That's negative 2 over 2, which is negative 1. So the answer to this question is A. And, and I know what happens with students. You look at this question, and you may even get it to this point here. And you say, well, it must have something to do with B. You probably wouldn't suspect that even though you don't know that parameter, you do know the range. Y is not equal to negative 1. Anyway, a long conversation, but that's all about Y coordinates of holes, which you're going to encounter tomorrow. I hope that helped, Kai. Other questions? Go ahead. 31. Okay. We're getting very close to the end of the course, and what's going to happen on the diploma exam is you're going to see questions that rely on a little bit of knowledge from this course to open the door into a bigger question. To, to start the question, you're going to use a bit of Math 30, and then it's just going to turn into either Math 10 or Math 20, and this is one of those questions. What you have is a rational function. That's why it's in this review package. The rational function is y is equal to a over x minus k 
minus 1. So you don't actually know the rational function. By the way, if you're asked for the non-permissible value, it's going to be whatever k is, right? I mean, if, if we determine, is the answer 7, by the way? I don't know how I could remember that, but I think the answer is 7, okay? Uh, if, if we discover that when we find out what k is, it's 7, I, I'm, we would have to know what a is as well. You'll see that in a, bin, in a minute. But if that's what we end up learning, then the, the non-permissible value is 7, okay? So how is it we find that? Well, these two things that I'm just going to highlight for you are missing parameters. And a missing parameter is found by typically loading in, this is the most efficient way, loading in for x and y in the function an ordered pair. And if all we were missing was a, we could put in an ordered pair and solve for a. If all we were missing was k, we could do the same thing. But when you have two missing parameters, you need to repeat the process and do it twice. So my ordered pairs are 6, 1 and 8, negative 3. So if I load 6 in for x, I get y coming out as being 1. So one of my equations will be 1 equals a over 6 minus k minus 1. So I put in 6 for x and 1 for y. I'm going to repeat the process now with 8 and 3. I'm going to get 8 coming out. Nope. I'm going to get negative 3 coming out. When I load in for x, 8. So again, I put in the x coordinate and I'm putting in the y coordinate. And these are, these are locked together, right? When I use the 8, I have to use the negative 3. I can't mix and match. I'm going to add 1 to both sides of this equation to, to get 2 equals a over 6 minus k. I'm going to add 1 to both sides of this equation to get negative 2 equals a over 8 minus k. And I need to tell you, I suppose, what I just assumed was obvious, but that's bad teaching. We're solving a system of equations, right? That's what we're doing here. Uh, I've got two equations with two unknowns. I'm going to solve them. Um, my motivation for doing this is that it's simpler. And my motivation in the next step is going to be I don't want to deal with fractions, so I'm going to multiply both sides of this first equation by 6 minus k. If you want to think of this as cross multiplication, that's fine, but a more general philosophy or approach here is you're eliminating denominators. I'm going to end up multiplying both sides of this equation by the 8 minus k. Of course, that cancels things, so I'm left with 12 minus 2k equals a. I, I've multiplied that too through why not, right? And over here, I'm going to get negative 16 plus 2k equals a, because again, these cancel. Well, that's fortuitous, because if I add those two equations, the k's go away. Now, I mean, admittedly, I want to find k. But I, uh, listen, I wouldn't arrange things so the A goes away so you can find the K. I, I, I think fewer steps is better in terms of, that's not going to be fewer steps. I think it's more direct to just get rid of K, find A, and then use A to find K. So when I add these two equations together, what do I get here? I get negative 4 equals 2A. That tells me a is negative 4 over 2. a is negative 2. And now to find k, I'm going to put negative 2 into either of the other two equations. I'm going to pick on the bottom equation, this one here. And I'll have negative 16 plus 2k equals negative 2. 
add 16 to both sides to get 2k equals 14. So divide both sides by 2 and you get k is equal to 7. A bit of a workout. And, and really, when you take a look at the big picture here, <laughs> the only thing that's a math 30 idea in this question, the only thing that's a math 30 idea in the question is recognizing that they're asking you for the value of k. That's it. I mean, if I would have said to you, if I would have given this to a math 20 class or a math 10 class and said, what is k equal to? That's just a system of equations with missing parameters. Now, you know, in 10 and 20, we don't deal with missing parameters as frequently as we do here. But anyway, is that okay? Okay. Other questions? Uh, sorry, let me turn around so I can see you. Other questions? Go ahead, Janessa. 26. So we want a composite function, and we're dealing with these three functions. All right. So we want the composite function f of h of x. And you might say, well, why are we given four functions? Because there were other questions, right? Okay. So we want f of h of x. And notice that what we are actually asked for is f of h of x, but I interpret that as f of h of x. Okay, what is f of h of x? What does that mean? It means we take h of x and we put it into the function f of x to get f of h of x. That's what we have to do. So I need to take h of x, which is this, and I need to put it in here and in here. Okay. And much along the same lines as the question that Thomas and I were just working on, this is now turned into a algebra problem from grade 9 or 10, really. Because once we do that, we get this new function, f of h of x, is root 2x plus 1 squared plus 2 root 2x plus 1 plus 4. I shouldn't say grade 9 because it's got radicals in it, and that maybe is pushing it. Uh, not with the first term getting rid of the radical, but with what this means, where it doesn't eliminate the radical. Uh, that's it. I mean, well, we've got a bit of work to do here. When I take the square of a square root of a thing, the square and the square root cancel because they're opposite operations. So. I'm getting f of h of x is equal to 2x plus 1 plus 2 root 2x plus 1. There's nothing I can do with that any more than there's anything I can do with 2r. It's 2r. 2 root 2x plus 1. You see where I got the 5 from? I'm actually thinking ahead here. Because I have this plus 4, I'm going to add it to the 1 over there. And I'm going to get 2x plus 5 plus 2 root 2x plus 1, which is d. Is that OK? I, I want to show you something. and. You may never use this. okay? But you might. I'm going to put in, for y1, I'm going to put in f of x. So I'm going to go back up to the top here. I'm going to put f of x in for y1. And that is x squared plus 2x plus 4. And I'm going to put in 
h of x for y2. And I'm going to turn them off. I, I'm going to I'm going to do something here that I'm not even sure you knew you could do. I I don't want to look at the graphs of them. Okay. So to turn them off, I scroll over so that my cursor is on the equal sign, and I hit enter, and the equal sign is no longer lit up. And I'm going to do the same thing here. What this means is if I go graph, nothing happens. It's not going to. It, it's saying, well, this guy doesn't want me to graph them. What I'm going to put for y3 is this. I'm going to put f of h of x. And I do that by typing. I guess I'll do it on here. If this is y1 and this is y2 and I want f of h of x, I enter this in my calculator. It doesn't mean times. The calculator knows I'm talking about a composition of functions. So if you have this kind of calculator, I think if you go alpha format, nope, alpha table set, nope, oh, alpha trace, there are your y's. There's another way to get them if you don't have that calculator, and I'll show you that in a second. So I go Y1, I go brackets, and then I repeat the process, and I choose Y2. This does not mean Y1 times Y2. It means Y1 of Y2. Now, why do I care about that? Because I can graph the composite of the function without even knowing what the composite is. Okay? And... I could, in a pinch, if I were stuck, and on the diploma exam, you got six hours. So if you need to spend some time trying something different, you got all the time in the world. If you graph D, if you put this in for Y4, it will match what we have here. So this is a way to tell your calculator to graph compositions of functions. Of course, that's not helpful on a written response. Other questions? Go ahead, Lynette. 37? All right. So we have three functions. We want to figure out what f times g over h quantity of x means. So the math 30 aspect of this question is knowing that f times g over h of x means f of x times g of x over h of x. And really at this point, this becomes a test of your algebra skills. This becomes a Math 20 rational expressions problem. I have to take f of x, which is 2x plus 1, over x. I have to multiply that by g of x, which is x plus 2. I'm going to throw some maybe unnecessary brackets there. And I'm going to divide that by h of x which is 2x minus 5 over x. And this shouldn't be a big surprise to anybody in the room. You should know exactly what I'm referring to when I say, look at how I wrote that x plus 2. I wrote it so that I can think of it as x plus 2 over 1. I'm dealing with a rational expression with fractions that are algebraic. So we want to simplify this. And I... I've had this conversation just very recently with my math 20s. This whole bit of business about when you divide by a fraction multiplied by the reciprocal is for junior high students. When you have this, which is admittedly dividing by a fraction, you view it as a complex fraction, and you multiply the numerator and the denominator by whatever you need to 
to eliminate any mini denominators. And just to highlight things here, what makes this a complex fraction is this and this. We've got to get rid of them. They've got to go. So I'm going to multiply top and bottom by x. What's going to happen here on the top, this x cancels with that x. I'm multiplying, so I don't, I don't multiply both pieces of the top by x. I multiply the entire top by x. And here this cancels, so what am I left with? I'm left with 2x plus 1 times x plus 2 over 2x minus 5. I believe in the question it says we get ax squared plus bx plus c over 2x minus 5. Am I right? So I think you see what we have to do here. We have to take those two binomials, 2x plus 1 and x plus 2, and foil them out. And I think you're fine from there. Okay. Other questions? Arianna? Uh, 23. 23. So this is related to this graph. We have two functions, f of x and g of x. And question 23 asks about a specific point on the product of the two functions. All right. What this question is about is the fact that when you add functions together or when you subtract functions or when you multiply functions or when you divide functions, it's the y coordinates which undergo the operation. So, for example, if, if I said to you, you know, to sketch the product of these two functions, then you can start over here at maybe 4, and you can say, well, the y-coordinate of this point is 1, the y-coordinate of this is 3, 1 times 3 is 3. Um, you could go here and say the y-coordinate is 2, the y-coordinate is 2, 2 times 2 is 4. And you could start building a picture of what the graph would look like. If I'm saying negative 5 is an x-coordinate on the product, then that means I'm looking over here at the graph at negative 5, and I'm taking these two y-coordinates and I'm multiplying them to get the value of the y-coordinate on the product when x is negative 5. So all I have to do is take 4 times 6 to get 24, and I can see that when x is negative 5, the y-coordinate is 24, so 24 is the answer to the question. Does that make sense? Okay. Other questions? Twenty-nine? Okay. I think this is a question where, to be honest, I think most people know what it is you have to do. It's just that there's so much to do. There, there really is. I mean, I think you understand that f minus g quantity of negative 3 means take f of negative 3 minus g of negative 3. And I think you understand what h of g of 2 means. It means put 2 into g and then put, it into, then put the result into h. And you understand that we're adding them. But there's just so much going on here. Let's break this down. So I want to know what f minus g of negative 3 is. Well, that's what this is. And then I want to add h of g of 2... And that's what this thing is, right? So, I mean, I, I would be very cautious on a written response in writing something like that. I might, you know, do the f of negative 3 minus g of negative 3 first on the side somewhere, 
And I wouldn't put the plus, I would do this other part on the other side, and then I can add them. So how do we find f of negative 3? Well, f of negative 3 means you go to negative 3 and you look at the y coordinate on f. Here is negative 3. The y coordinate on f is 3. So f of negative 3 is 3. It's all about y coordinates, right? For, wait, just a second. It's all about y coordinates for operations. For compositions, which is the other part of this, it's about x coordinates creating y-coordinates, and those y-coordinates become x-coordinates. It, it's totally different. Okay. Um, what is g of negative 3? Well, we go over to negative 3. I guess we have three functions here, right? Eh? g of negative 3 is negative 2. So I have 3 minus negative 2. Plus, let's figure this out. 2 goes in to g. That means 2 is an x-coordinate. Don't try to find the equation of these lines. You could do it that way and use the equation, but if I just you know, close my eyes and draw a random graph, you can't do that. So 2 goes in for x. Where's 2? 2 is here. And what comes out of g? 2 goes in. What comes out of g is 3. So this 3 that comes out is a y-coordinate that comes out. But it becomes an x-coordinate that goes in to the next machine, the next function. So now 3, which is here, goes in. What comes out of h? What comes out of h is negative 1. So I end up with 3 minus negative 2, and then plus negative 1. That gives me 5 plus negative 1, which is 4, which I don't recognize that answer, but can you confirm that is the answer? OK, good. I, I saw somebody else's hand up. Other questions? Thirty-nine. Another question that's that's turning into a non-unit six question very quickly. It's not going to turn into right away at all, in fact. It's not going to turn into a grade 10 or 11 question. It's going to turn into a unit 5 question, I believe. h of x is f of g of x. k of x is g of f of x. What is h minus k of 2.4? OK. There's so many ways we can do this. And I know that some of you like an algebraic approach. Okay, I'm not going to do an algebraic approach here. I'm simply going to say that the thing we're after is h of 2.4 minus k of 2.4. So there are a couple of ways for us to figure these out. Again, if you want to build a function, if you want to figure out what f of g of x is by looking at f of x and g of x, you can. I'm not going to do that. I'm going to say that this thing... is found by taking 2.4, feeding it through g, taking the result, and feeding it through f, and feeding it through f to get this. And I've, I've gone a little crazy with my highlighting there. Let me fix that. You might wonder what I'm talking about. H of 2.4 is whatever comes out of that whole thing. Okay. 
uh, who had asked about this question? Lynette? Okay. So 2.4 goes into G. So that means I'm going to have to figure out what log base 2 of 2.4 is. And, and I, I really believe that at some point in time, you just use your calculator here. I don't think we want to set up a, an equation and change this to an exponential equation. Log base 2 of 2.4. My calculator right now does not have the log base function. I've turned it off of that mode. So I'm going to use the change of base formula by entering log of 2.4 divided by log of 2. Regardless, Lynette, are you okay with figuring out that log base 2 of 2.4 is that number? Now that number, 1.26, comes out of G. Now I have to put it into the next function. So I have to figure out what 6 raised to the 1.26 is. And I think, quite frankly, what makes this question somewhat challenging is there's just a lot to keep track of. So about 9.61. If I'm writing an exam, I would probably store that. As A, there's, do you often scroll up and grab the numbers? Okay, so you're fine with managing these numbers. Now, this part... will be found by taking 2.4. K of x is g of f of x, so I have to take this 2.4 and feed it through f this time, and then feed it through g. Does that make sense, Lynette? Okay. So this time, and I'm going to just abbreviate my discussion here. I need to take 6 to the 2.4 first. Then I need to find the log, the base 2 logarithm of that, which is log of that divided by log of 2, which gives me this. 6.2 comes out. So after all of that, h minus k of 2.4 will be 9.61 minus the 6.2. Gives me about 3.4, which I hope is the answer. Yeah. Other questions? Yeah. 22? The question is, how many x-intercepts will f minus g of x have? And there's a, a lot of flavors of this kind of question. I could ask you, how many x-intercepts will f over g have? How many x-intercepts will f times g have? And the most challenging one will be, how many x-intercepts would f plus g have? But we can talk about them individually in a second. Let's deal, first of all, with this one. An x-intercept, forgetting about operations of functions or this particular question or even math 30. An x-intercept is where y is equal to 0. Right? This is the most salient, important point. When you subtract functions, which is what we're dealing with here, you subtract y coordinates at every location x, y's. In other words, if I wanted to start plotting points here, I would go, say, over here to 4, and I would take the y coordinate on f, 
and subtract the y coordinate on g. So that would be 1 minus 3, it would be negative 2, and we would plot that point. If I wanted to do that over here at 0, I would take the y coordinate on f, which is 3, and subtract the y coordinate on g, which is 2, and get, which is 1, and get 2. Are you with me on that? But the only way I can subtract the y coordinates to get a new y coordinate of 0 is if the y coordinates that I'm subtracting are the same number. In other words, any point of intersection of these two functions will result when I subtract the y coordinates will result in an x intercept. Right? 2 minus 2 will give you 0. Uh, 3.4 minus 3.4 will give you 0. So the answer to the question is 2. If I said, I, I'm going to make up a question. And I don't know how well this will work out for one of the things I want to talk about here in the last few minutes, but if I have this function and I have this function, and I say to you, the, how many x-intercepts on f minus g, let's call this f and this g, and f is a straight line, by the way. Okay. Um, the answer is 2. Because the y coordinates are the same here, and they're going to intersect someplace else. Even though you can't see the point of intersection, they will intersect someplace else. If I say to you, how many x-intercepts are there on f times g? And I'm going to make an assumption here, everybody, that these intersect someplace other than on the x-axis, okay? The graph on an exam would be better. The answer is going to be 3. Because you're multiplying the y-coordinates. The y-coordinate here is 0 times whatever y-coordinate this is is still going to be 0. Over here, since the y-coordinate is 0, when I multiply by the other y-coordinate, I get 0. Way over here, where I multiply by 0, doesn't matter what the y-coordinate is because this y-coordinate is 0. I don't care what the other one is. I'm going to get 0. If I said to you f over g, the answer is 1. Because the only way f over g can be 0 is if the top is 0. And there's only one place where f is 0. There's only one x-intercept. If I said g over f, the answer would be 2. Because g has two x-intercepts. If I asked you about holes and asymptotes, it's a little bit different. The tough one would be, and I've tried to draw it so that I believe it would work, it would be 1. Because I've tried to draw it so there's a place over here somewhere where the two y's are equal but opposite. But I don't think I would ever ask you about that. I think that's dirty. All right. So bell's going to ring here in a couple of minutes. I hope that was helpful. Um, again, you can start your exam early tomorrow. Tomorrow morning I will have the exams laid out, unless you're writing in the library, in which case you go there at the beginning of class. I'll have the exams laid out face down or close so you can't start them. You can come in if you like and probably around, I don't know, 5 to, like shortly after the seminar flex, whatever we call it. What are these things called? What is it? Saver support. Been so many variations.
flex, whatever, saber support. Uh, shortly after saber support starts, you'll be able to start your exam. Okay. Hope you have a wonderful rest of the day, and it was nice to see everybody this morning. We'll see you all later.